help you pick the right stock at the right time. Good morning, you're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First the headlines this morning. Asian stocks trade cautiously after last week's Wall Street retreat. The Japanese markets are closed for a public holiday. The GST Council cuts tax rates of 22 items during its meet on Saturday. Tax rates on cement and some auto component parts remain unchanged at 28%. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has tried to calm markets by saying that Fed Chair Jerome Powell will not be sacked, despite the administration's disagreement over the Fed's policy decision to hike interest rates. Sugar stocks will be in focus today after the PTI reported that the government may be considering an additional soft loan worth 7,400 crore rupees to the sugar mills to create further ethanol capacity. And the Ministry of Corporate Affairs has alleged that the auditors of a debt-laden RNFS group acted in a negligent and fraudulent manner to prepare false financial statements. Let's talk about that U.S. Uh, market session on Friday. Uh, U.S. stocks, in fact, sank to a 19-month low on Friday to close out their worst week since August 2011, with every sector losing ground and heavy selling in technology shares driving the Nasdaq into a bear market. Abigail Doolittle of Bloomberg News wraps up uh, all of the action on Wall Street in this report. It was another brutal day for stocks in Friday's Wall Street session with the Dow, the S&P 500, the Nasdaq all tumbling by 1.8 percent or more. Both the Dow and the S&P 500 down closer to 2 percent. The tech-heavy Nasdaq, though, falling 3 percent, also falling into an official bear market or down more than 20 percent from its all-time high. And on the week, big losses as well. Each of the major averages down 6.8 percent or more. For the Dow and the Nasdaq, that was the worst uh, weekly performance since 2008, going back a decade. So from a sector standpoint, won't be surprising to hear that was bearish too, as investors are simply going out of risk assets and going into cash. The Bloomberg dollar index was up more than half a percent on the day, but those sectors down once again, all 11 of the S&P 500 sectors on Friday falling. The FANG trade really standing out. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Alphabet, those internet names, those once high-flying momentum names, investors really Going into cash, that trade down 5% on the day. And the biotech index also down sharply 4%. One bright spot, though, Nike, those shares did rally by about 7%. This on a strong quarterly uh, report. And two Chinese internet names also rallied on the day, both JD.com and NetEase, both up 3.6% or more. But overall, it was a risk-off day. Investors moving away from risk assets such as stocks and commodities going into the dollar. And again, for both the Dow and the NASDAQ, it was the worst weekly performance since 2008 as that tech-heavy NASDAQ fell into a bear market. Reporting from New York, I'm Bloomberg News' Abigail Doolittle. Now, one of the big updates over the weekend and something that's actually roiled uh, U U.S., well, at least the futures and possibly trade in Asia is the fact that there is a report that states that U.S. President Trump is again questioning whether he can legally fire Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, arguing the central bank's decision to keep raising interest rates is crippling the U.S. economy. So far, Trump's advisers have warned the U.S. president that he lacks the legal power to fire the Fed chair and attempting to do so would plunge already volatile markets into further disarray. Ross Franzi of Bloomberg News has more details in this report. Uh, president Trump or his aides are looking to convene a meeting with the Fed chief <clears throat> over the next few weeks, something that certainly isn't unusual. I mean, presidents and uh, Fed officials do meet from time to time. Certainly, uh, President Obama used to meet with Janet Yellen on a regular basis. But given Trump's uh, relentless criticism of the Fed, Fed interest rate hikes, and Jay Powell himself, uh, you know, it certainly seems like they're... they're um, coming into a bit of a clash. I don't know what the purpose of the meeting really would be to achieve uh, and whether the president thinks he can browbeat uh, 
Jay Powell in person versus the kind of jawboning he's been doing on Twitter and in interviews recently. Um, and it's certainly on unner- the markets, as, as you've noted. Uh, we've heard from a lot of uh, traders and lawmakers over the weekend that, you know, this would be a, a really sort of catastrophic event in terms of uh, Fed independence uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, any, and many other things. So it doesn't look good. Uh, and we're probably waiting to hear more about what this meeting might be about. Now, that conversation about the Fed's independence seems familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, but uh, let's talk about uh, other aspects of uh, what's happening this week in emerging markets. If emerging markets had their way, in fact, this Christmas week would be like any other. Quiet with just a handful of economic releases and low trading volumes. But political drama playing out in the U.S. is keeping investors on tender hooks. Adam Haig of Bloomberg News has all the details in this report. Significant valuation discounts now in a number of Asian equity markets and and indeed uh, we've had some relief rallies in some of the Asian FX markets Um, there are people who who believe that that, you know there's some uh, there's some more strength to come there but as you pointed out very very few equity markets have had positive returns in in 2018 and indeed lots of forecasts going into next year are uh, are somewhat uh, bound by the fact that you still have the overarching trade war issue you still have a, an earnings growth environment that's very restricted on a number of fronts. Uh, in, in places like Japan, the, the consensus numbers have been dialed down significantly, and you've got foreign investors fleeing the market quite at a, quite a significant clip. Uh, and then in places like China uh, and, and Hong Kong that are you know, very deep into to, to bear markets, you still have the overarching worry of, of, of how the tech sector performs. That's one of the notable re-rated sectors uh, this year, uh, the Asian tech space and of course um, you know in markets like like India that have that have done okay lately but they have their own problems going into 2019 with the general elections and and the the most recent local elections showing that Modi uh, is is in somewhat of a predicament going into those elections so plenty of worries in in big markets like like India as well so across the board as we get into this uh, holiday season it's, it's difficult to to really see any chance of a sustainable rebound uh, from here the only kind of saving grace, I suppose, is that as liquidity does come off, you can get a more sizable moves. So that there may be a little bit more uh, the, the, the potential for people to, to take a bit of, of risk if they're feeling brave at the end of the year. Well, that's the question, isn't it, uh, when it comes to equity markets. I do want to point out that one of the big talking points over the weekend has been the U.S. government shutdown that was uh, that came into play rather at the end of last week. The expectation, of course, is that it's going to continue late into this week and possibly into early January uh, because there's no common ground as of now between the Democrats and the Republicans with regard to the funding that U.S. Car President Donald Trump is demanding for the border wall that uh, was such a big part of his election campaign. Uh, Let's talk about the Asian markets now. When uh, I looked at it perhaps an hour back, there were only two markets that were open. Of course, the Japanese Nikkei or the Japanese markets are shut today for a public holiday. Um, You had Sydney that was trading perhaps a little bit in uh, the green, and you had the Kospi in South Korea that was trading with cuts of about four-tenths of a percent. That continues to be the case. Uh, But you have a sea of red in the other markets that just about opened up. So you have the Chinese markets uh, that have opened very clearly in the red. You also have the Hang Seng that's got cuts of about 1.2% in the first few minutes. So very clearly uh, negative sentiment being reflected in uh, the initial ticks that you see in those markets in Asia. Uh, Agam Vakil is joining me now to tell you all about the trade setup for the day in India and all that's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, well, what are you picking up today? Uh, well, Alex, uh, the SGX Nifty is clearly not uh, picked up uh, such bad sentiment at this point in time, considering it's marginally in the red. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the SGX Nifty, and uh, there you have it, just about an 11-point cut, despite the fact that weakness continues in the U.S. markets. And uh, uh, what we saw last Friday was a lot of weakness in the, around uh, uh, in our markets. So as you can see, nearly 2% cuts for the Nifty, and the mid-cap and the small-cap indices declining in trade, with the Nifty banking indices also declining 
think coming off to a certain extent the nifty bank index but particularly on the back of some private sector banks but uh, uh, talking about uh, your other uh, factors in the markets and uh, in terms of sectors again uh, a lot of weakness in the nifty it index down 2.3% auto index down 2% and uh, coming down to adrs uh, weakness continues there as well for wipro icici bank hdfc bank infosys and uh, among others as well as you can see not no respite there for adrs but uh, uh, when it comes to institutional flows again uh, gross numbers were small and uh, nothing conclusive to draw a trend line as far as your FIs or DIs are concerned and their participation in the market. But coming down to your contributors, uh, we did see a lot of weakness across the board. And while we did see that cut of around 197 points, uh, majority of that was coming on back of Reliance Industries, ICICI Bank and SPI. Of course, uh, we're going to have to make a little bit of correction there when it comes to contributors. But uh, because, uh, well, okay, the numbers don't add up. But uh, yes, uh, we did have a lot of weakness in a whole host of these, uh, these, these companies. Let's move on and talk about futures and options. And uh, well, it is expiry week. It is a truncated expiry week considering tomorrow's a holiday. Rollovers have started to pick up. Uh, moving down to Nifty Bank futures as well, what we're seeing is nearly 16% uh, in, uh, in your rollovers. But uh, let's talk, talk about some of your other factors and what we're seeing is a change in open interest writing among upper levels on expected lines considering the Nifty came off around 2%. And uh, when it comes to changes in uh, rather your open interest distribution, uh, the only thing that looks sacrosanct at this point in time, and it's not really sacrosanct, but it is the 11,000 call which has the maximum open interest. All others have inconclusive open interest accumulation in relation to the 11,000 call. But, um, your Wix uh, did rise around another 11.6%. It's still not about the mark of 16, 16 and a half, as a lot of traders are pointing out. And that would be a problematic area. But uh, let's talk about uh, your PCR, and that has, of course, come off to around 1.28. Similarly, the bank Nifty PCR also at around 0 0.86. And moving on to uh, stocks, uh, we do have Reliance Capital, which has moved out of the FNO band. So that leaves uh, us with Jet Air and uh, two, the two Adani Group companies companies in the FNO band, but um, Adani Pause, of course, uh, is the one which is in focus considering accumulation of open interest towards shorts. Besides Adani Pause, uh, let's also bring up something like a CG Power. Do remember, it's one a very large order, and uh, it's likely to see a further upside should we see a continuation of, uh, well, some of these this order intake. But uh, moving on, we also have uh, Sriram Transport Finance, another stock which was uh, really under pressure last Friday, is down around 5.3%. So uh, once again, um, a lot of stocks to watch, but uh, I'm really curious because, Alex, I just saw the SGX Nifty uh, turn unchanged. Of course, is now indicating a, a, a 5, 15 point decline. So I wonder how Indian markets will react to mm. global queues. Ah, it's really interesting. In fact, those uh, GST cuts uh, over the weekend also to uh, to look at and right. and to really study. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, of course, over the course of the day. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Well, Let's talk about the rupee as well. Snapping its four-day rising streak on uh, the rupee on Friday fell by 48 paise to close at 70.18 against the U.S. Uh, dollar due to month-end dollar demand. Apparently, the dollar index uh, had dropped by one percent to 96.55 due to concerns over weak economic growth and signs of uh, the U.S. government shutdown, which eventually came to pass like I told you over the weekend in fact the US dollar index rose on a safe haven demand uh, and came to close to 97 and it's come down from then uh, since uh, because there is there was an update of course uh, by Stephen Mnuchin the Treasury Secretary and he said that there is no call uh, really by the administration to fire Jay Powell who is the Fed chairman but let's also talk about the, uh, the benchmark 10-year bond yield. It fell 16 basis points to 7.28% last week, marking a fifth weekly loss. All right, let's talk about commodities now. The OPEC hasn't even started implementing its new six-month agreement to cut output, and already members responsible for the most of the reductions have pledged to extend or even deepen it. Uh, Hisu Lee of Bloomberg News sums up all that you need to know about the oil prices in this report.
oil prices have plunged more than 10 percent, even after OPEC Plus Alliance has decided to trim output by 1.2 million barrels a day in early December. Obviously, the agreement is to prop up prices and to reduce the oversupply, but the market has been having doubts over the effectiveness of the deal. That's because there are fears over surging U.S. shale production, as well as concerns over weakening global economic growth. Um, despite Saudi oil minister's comments on how the producer group will most likely extend the agreement in April, his assurance didn't do much to stop the decline in oil prices. Because the plan cuts haven't done much to stabilize the market, uh, some members of the OPEC have already said that they will extend or even deepen um, their six-month accord to uh, curb production. Um, officials from Iraq, Kuwait, and the U UAE agreed to, um, with Saudi Arabia, uh, expectation that the group will extend the agreement for another six months. Saudis have volunteered to take the lead in trimming output um, by more than it has agreed. The kingdom plans to pump um, about 10.2 million barrels a day in January, rather than 10.3 million barrels um, a day alluded to it um, in the OPEC Plus agreement. All right, that's the update on oil prices, of course. Uh, now, let's also talk about what happened over the weekend. I briefly talked about this, and it could have an impact uh, in trade today. The Goods and Services Tax Council cut rates on 22 items at its meeting on Saturday. The council also decided on a new composition scheme for the services sector and changes to the return filing system. Nikunj Ori lists out all the major decisions that were made. The GST Council has approved uh, lowering of rates on certain items which were previously taxed at 28% and has brought them down to sub-28% tax slabs. Some of these items include monitors and TVs with screen size up to 32 inches, retreaded tyres and uh, lithium-ion batteries used for power banks. All these items have been brought down from 28% to 18%. Uh, cinema tickets costing rupees 100 will now be taxed at, at 12 percent and cinema tickets over rupees 100 will attract a tax rate of 18 percent from 28 percent earlier. Considering the revenue implications, uh, the GST Council did not uh, uh, approve lowering of GST on cement, uh, air conditioners and dishwashers. Considering these are, uh, dishwashers are still used by a certain category of uh, consumers who can still afford paying a higher rate of tax. Uh, besides this, some of the policy changes that have been approved by the GST Council include a new composition scheme for, uh, serv uh, for, services, for service providers and the threshold and the limit uh, for, uh, for uh, taxpayers who will be able to avail this composition scheme will be decided in consultation with the Law and Fitment Committee. Uh, the new return filing system that has already been approved by the GST Council will uh, be implemented on a trial basis from April 1 and, um, and the mandatory implementation of the new return filing system will uh, start from July 1, 2019. Besides this, a group of ministers has also been constituted to study the revenue trend of states and analyze the reasons why some of the states are still reporting revenue shortfalls. All right. Now, the finance minister also made a few policy changes in the GST Council meet on Saturday and discussed the impact uh, for, on, on the revenue uh, uh, for the whole year. Listen in. After consideration, since it's a new taxation system and the number of registrants has already increased, so the council was of the view that we should now... Uh, 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 encourage more and more people who have been left outside the system to join the taxation system. And that's why, the 31st March, the people who are paying for 2019, will not be any fee or additional penalty. One time, one time. One this time. is only a one-time one offer which is being made. So those who, have not, who are supposed to pay GST and file their returns, but have not done that, should uh, 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 file it by the 31st of March, 2019, and all they have to pay is their tax liability, if any. There will be no penalty or uh, any other liability. All the decisions taken today, whether in relation to service tax or in relation to goods, the total revenue impact for the whole year is estimated to be approximately about 5,500 crores. Yeah, for the full fiscal. In India, 
cricket is considered to be an absolute religion and seemingly there's no sp space for for the other sports but slowly you're seeing that uh, sports like football sports like kabaddi are making headway and apparently basketball is too the rising popularity of the sport has prompted the nba to bring two preseason games to india next year i'm talking about the nba Indiana Pacers and Sacramento Kings will play two matches in Mumbai next year. Hormuz Fatakia caught up with the top management of the NBA and spoke to them about the rationale behind this move and how they plan to tackle competition from other sports, particularly cricket. India is a priority market for us. We have seen tremendous growth in the game of basketball and in all of our NBA metrics over the last several years. 120 million people tuned in to watch NBA games last year. Three million Facebook fans on the NBA India page with 1.4 billion impressions. Um, we had 10 million kids participate in junior NBA programs over the last five years. And so we're seeing tremendous growth in the in the sport and in the NBA and those are some of the reasons that we decided to bring the games here to India. Most of our players from the current setup here in India yeah. come from smaller towns and the tier two or tier three cities. Uh, what sort of plans do you have to promote the game there and uh, did you have in mind that you could host your preseason games somewhere in a tier two town or a tier three town expecting a better response as compared to a metro like Mumbai? You know I think um, from, from a talent perspective, I think that's been one of the great things in terms of uh, our talent search, which we do with ACG uh, NBA Jump, the program, as well as our Alliance Foundation Junior NBA program. We've kind of democratized how you can actually find a route to be uh, successful in basketball. Our Reliance Foundation Junior NBA program last year was in 34 cities. Uh, ACG NBA Jump, which was the, the kind of selection process for our academy, had entries from over 40 cities or 40 cities and villages across the country. If you look at the first batch of 24 kids, we had kids from uh, Mumbai, we had kids from, um, from uh, Ludhiana, we had kids from Kochi, so we had kids from all over the place. And I think that's the great thing about all the activities that we're doing, we're seeing the kind of adoption, whether it's participation, whether it's talent coming from all over. Uh, Mark, I remember speaking to you the last time, a couple of years back, and uh, I remember asking you, how would you promote a game like basketball in a cricket-obsessed nation like ours? Now, uh, since the, from the time I last spoke to you, the sporting landscape in India has changed drastically. Uh, now you have the Pro Kabaddi League, now you have the Pro Badminton League, you have a Tennis League, you have an ISL. So games like these have got a much wider exposure because of this on national television uh, does that deter the nba in any way and uh, now how do you plan to take the game forward in india considering competition is much more and much more than just cricket yeah no it doesn't deter us at all i actually think it's very encouraging because what that says to me is that the market and the Indian market and the Indian fan and consumer is starting to consume more sports. And they're starting to be more willing and open to say, we love different sports. We want to experience different sports um, in addition to cricket. Cricket, of course, is so popular here, but the fact that these other sports now can emerge in the Indian landscape is positive for the NBA. And I think that it, we've seen from the actual metrics of our growth that that's happening. We have seen the number of fans, the number of people who are consuming the NBA product now and consuming basketball is growing exponentially. And so for us, it's, it's all very, very encouraging. Uh, Yannick, a follow-up to that. Uh, do you think a, a national level league like the IPL or an ISL is the need of the hour to give a much wider exposure to basketball in a country like India? You know, I think that raising the level of competition uh, in the sport at various levels, whether it's uh, you know at the junior level, school level, collegiate level, or the professional level, I think it's important. It's an important part of developing the ecosystem and success in a sport. So, you know, anything that can actually help grow that ecosystem, including raising the level, which could potentially be you know better, uh, higher quality of tournaments, professional league, is something that we'd support because you know as we've always said. 
our primary focus is let's grow the game of basketball. So we know that the Basketball Federation of India, uh, along with their partners, have spoken about doing, uh, you know, more competitions, including potentially professional league. And it's something that, you know, if, if, if we are asked to help and uh, assist with, it's something we will definitely look at because we think raising the level of competition is an important component of building the basketball ecosystem in India. You know, I like the fact that some of you are quoting Bloomberg Quint reports in the chat uh, that I see over here, and you're telling other people that uh, the top-rated uh, 10 companies have lost X, Y, Z in, in market share uh, or market cap. Uh, I like that, but there's lots more on the website that you can read. Here are just a couple of stories that are available. The government is considering an additional soft loan of 7,400 crore rupees uh, to sugar mills for creating ethanol capacity under a recently launched scheme, according to sources. That's a PTI report. The Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Board has suggested that it is not the right time to list the firm's overseas investment arm, that's ONGC Videsh, on the bourses. And the statutory auditors of INFS acted in a negligent and fraudulent manner and prepared incorrect financial statements of the debt-laden conglomerate. Uh, that's according to an allegation by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs that is based on an interim report filed by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Now, not the best news coming in from Indonesia over the weekend. More than 200 people, mostly tourists, are confirmed dead in Indonesia after two provinces were hit by a tsunami late on Saturday. More than 800 are injured and the death toll may rise as rescuers continue to search for dozens missing in the tourist region. Suspected volcanic activity near the Sunda Strait is said to have triggered the tsunami. tsunami. Well, uh, on that somewhat sorry note, uh, here's wishing all of you a very, very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. We'll be back, of course, before the uh, end of the year. But here's wishing you and your families a very Merry Christmas from all of us here at Bloomberg Quick.